good morning, everybody. I don't know how late you people stayed last night. <laughs> Some people still up on the night. Sound insulation is not a good enough. All right. Well, um, so we're going to talk about some other introduction, but I guess I'll do it. So this, uh, we had some kind of questions and discussion about inflation last night. And for a lot of the questions about that, the people have to like, write that down. This is the inflation morning. Uh, so I'm going to start telling you, uh, with, uh, by telling you about this new price index that we sort of created this year. Uh, it's not so much about directly inflation as in what's happening in the overall economy. It's more about what people... Can Terry just asked, can we have some lights in here? <laughs> will it work? Will it work with the... We can, but we'll lose the slide on the on the wall we'll video. You want to try it? Try Let's try it. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. That'll work. Can we do that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so let me tell you about the idea behind this uh, index. Uh, AIR has been tracking prices and cost of living and things like that forever, uh, for as long as the institute existed. And actually, for many years, we published something that we call a cost of living guide, which was sort of, it was based on the consumer price index changes and say how person power of the dollar changed over time, is basically what that is. And very often, especially in recent years, we would get comments from people that like, uh, that say that, well, you know, official numbers say CPI says inflation was 3% last year. But that's not what I feel. That's, I feel like, you know, prices went up more. People say that. Sometimes people would even claim that government wasn't making up the numbers. Who can the book somehow to hide the true inflation? Uh, we don't believe that, but I did hear that from people personally. Uh, now, one of the people who complained about official numbers not mentioned the experience was Terry last time, actually. <laughs> and I was talking about the cost of living adjustment for Social Security. There was some presentation about that. and. Uh, Specifically, at that point, the, the the point of that story was there's not going to be a cost of adjustment that particular year because the price index went down. And Terry goes like, no, but my expenses went up. <laughs> uh, so there is this disconnect a little bit about what official numbers say and what people think inflation is. This is not to say that any of this is wrong, but there is a you have to carefully look at what price indices do measure. So consumer price index, the one that's most widely quoted of all the price indices, looks at all the goods and services people buy and how their prices change in a year. Now one reason, pretty obvious reason, why a person might feel that their personal inflation, so to speak, is different from what CPI says is because a person is not an average of all the people. CPI averages out what everybody buys. Now, if so if a, a particular person has a different sort of set of things that they buy, and those prices increase more than other prices, then they would feel a higher inflation. But there's also another reason we thought people might feel this disconnect. When you look at all consumer prices, they include, they include everything. They include food, gas, shoes, new cars, houses, refrigerators, televisions, all of those things. Now, some of those things you buy often, like gas and food would be one of those. Some of those you buy very rarely. Well, it was last time you bought a fridge, I don't know, maybe once in 10 years or something like that, or a house or a car. So some of the prices people get reminded of all the time, like the gasoline would be the best example. Some prices, like televisions, people don't get reminded of all that much. So they might just not feel like, you know, the prices are rising because last time you bought this thing was five years ago. So what we try to do here is create an index that would reflect people's day-to-day -day experience with prices. That's why we call it everyday price index. So let's see. So basically we're trying to capture the day-to-day -day experience with prices of, for the goods that people buy. Uh, and I, I'll tell you in a minute exactly how it's built. 
where we where I want to make sure are prompt when we, when we released this in January, it got picked up in a lot of newspapers and many of the media outlets, not to necessarily criticize you people, interpret it as, as if we're saying CPI is wrong and the true inflation is really different. No, no, we're not saying the CPI is wrong. CPI is different from what we measure. CPI measures overall trend prices in the economy. What we measure is trend of prices of the things people buy frequently. And, and then that would reflect the sort of the sticker shock that people get getting frustrated or upset with their grocery bill, their gas bill, or their utilities bill, that sort of thing. Uh, so here's what we found. This is a teaser, and I'll tell you the details. For, the, for 2011, the inflation in these everyday prices was, in fact, much higher than overall inflation in the CPI. For the everyday prices, inflation was 8%. Uh, every, uh, official CPI inflation was 3.1. So there's something going on that inflation, that prices of certain goods go, fa go up faster than others, not surprising, but those also happen to be the goods you buy very often. Another interesting uh, point uh, that I'll show you on the chart later is that the behavior of these everyday prices and the overall CPI was pretty similar up to early, to start, like some of 2002, 2003. They were pretty much tracking each other, so it didn't really matter which index you used for things like cost of living adjustment or something like that. After 2002, they diverged. It's like there's like a break and something different of it happening to everyday prices versus all other prices. All right. To tell you how this thing is constructed, it's a little bit like showing how sausages are made. So bear with me. You might get sort of surprised. I'll first tell you how CPI is constructed. This is the table official from BLS. Uh, I'll show you a little more detail here. Basically, um, what we what we're looking at is a subset of goods that people buy. What CPI looks at is all the goods and services that people buy. How do they know how that's done? Uh, they do a survey, consumer expenditure survey. Now they do it every other year. They used to do it less often. Than that. They literally go out and do a survey of what households buy down to like lettuce and eggs and paper and paper towels and all that. I mean, down to little, little things. Uh, and they create this list of everything that people buy, track their prices, and then make an average of those prices to make a CPI. What do they average by? By the fraction of the expenditure they spend on a particular bill. So if you spend a lot of money, you know, people spend 20% of the money on gasoline, the gasoline price is going to get 20% weight. If you spend 1% of your money on chocolates, the chocolates get 1%. This is a list, more or less disaggregated, of all the things that go in the CPI. Uh, well, there are big categories like food and beverages, and they account, in, in 2011, they accounted for about 15% of all the expenditures. And this is the stuff that's underneath, like, bread and cakes and cupcakes and cookies and you know ground beef and pork chops and all those things that's all the various food stuff and then there is a category well then there's food in restaurants and things and there's housing which obviously is a big chunk of your expenditure about 40 percent on average in the u.s that includes rent uh hotels it also includes the way if you if you own a house you don't pay rent the way it's captured is called owner equivalent rent of residence. So that's a tricky way to compute that. It's not necessarily the point for this presentation. And then there is utilities for your house and you know, electricity, water, garbage collection. And then there are things like window coverings, linens, bedroom furniture, appliances, all your know, dishes at flat and flat I mean, this is pretty detailed. Now, in practice, under every one of these, there is an actual list of goods, which we obviously won't go into much detail here. Um, there is a big, there is a category apparel, which we are definitely not spending much money on. It's <laughs> only less than four percent. This is, you know, clothes, shoes, and so on. Transportation, which includes new cars, used cars, trucks. Then there is gasoline, and there is tires and parts and repairs insurance for cars, 
public transportation including like airlines or city bus. And there's medical care, prescription drugs, medical equipment, hospital services, all that. Then there is all various things they call recreation, which is TVs, cable TV service, uh, video, audio, pets, evidently recreation, sporting goods, photography, um, toys, all that kind of stuff. Newspapers and magazines will be happy to know is in recreation. <laughs> Uh, as are books and other things. For some reason, under recreational goods, there is also, you know, <laughs> fabric and some, I don't know what, maybe it's recreation. <laughs> There's education and communication, for some reason, that, like, education is like books, uh, tuition fees, including things like colleges, schools, childcare. Communication includes phone and internet, but also includes postal service and delivery. Uh, computers are in here somewhere in information technology goods, computers and software and accessories and other stuff. So this is more or less comprehensive list of all the things that people buy out of which five pages long, out of which CPI is made. So what we've done is we went through this list, try to select what we think are everyday expenditures. Our rule of thumb was pick the things that people buy at least once a month. Now, some of these are pretty obvious. You know, food is one of them, gasoline is one of them, utilities is one of them. Rent, uh, housing, however, you know, own equivalent housing or rent, we didn't put in there because that price doesn't change month to month. You do pay it if you're renting, you do rent it every month, but there's not a price variation in it. it things like new cars, used cars, and so on are also not in our index. You don't buy those every month. Things like televisions, computers, Appliances are not in our index because you don't buy those every month. You use them, but you don't buy them. So you don't face the price change for these goods. Sorry, right. and which one of those columns is weighted? Is it? Well, there are two different. Since this is not for the future, but I can answer. There are two different CPIs. There is the one. The one that says CPI U on top is called CPI for all urban consumers. That's usually the one you hear about. CPI W is a CPI for Urban wage owners and clerical workers. There is, uh, it's it, it's a uh, the weights are different in it because the different population is sampled to figure out how they spend their money. The, the reason why you might hear about it outside of economic circles is because that's the one that's used for cost of living adjustment for social security. CPIW is. W. Why don't they don't try Do they cover uh, rent? Yes, there is rent and housing. This is housing. So this is rent, the primary oh, residence. Okay. And then this is what it costs you to own a house, so to speak, if you, if you own a house. It's not quite the mortgage payment, but it's sort of linked to it. Do they cover all the cities? Uh, yes, for CPI, well, the way, yes, the way they do this is that, so the survey, uh, that creates both this list and, and the weights, they cover, this is urban population, so that covers something like 87, 85, 87% of everybody. Uh, uh, so if you wanna read drill in much more detail about it, because it's, uh, you know, there is a methodological, methodology book, booklet for CPI and the consumer expenditure survey where this is My point was to just show you the sort of the full set of things that people look at for price index and then tell you what we did is we took a subset for the things that we think people buy every month. So what ends up happening is that uh, we exclude most of the durable, well, basically all the durable goods. All the appliance, household appliances, computers, phones, uh, cars is not in the everyday price index because those are things bought infrequently. We also exclude apparel. You do buy it more often than cars, but not necessarily every month. And we exclude things that are fixed in time by price, like rent or, rent or own equivalent rent is not there. Uh, I'll show you exactly what's included in a second. So we also 
these weights that you just saw in the table, we take those weights directly from the CPI. We didn't make up our own weights because they, they have their consumer expenditure, so it's how people spend their money. So we, th we take those weights from there to make our index. Also, the weights, as you might imagine, change from time to time. The fraction of uh, your expenditure that you spend on cellular phone services is different now from 1975 because at that point it was zero. <laughs> it's also different from what it was in 1995. So we adjust these weights every year. We take the, I mean, the uh, PLS publishes the weights. So we, we take the, the weights from them, but we change them every year to account for the change in expenditure patterns. So what this actually means is that so EPI reflects how the prices of these frequently purchased goods change over time. The one thing they will do is it will more or less match people's experience of what they remember prices doing because those are the prices they see a lot. Practically, I think the, the coolest part about the API is what it will tell you is fluctuations in these prices is like the uncertainty, the, the risk or the price and risk that you face of the things you have to, you have to buy food, gas, pay utilities, you have to do this every month. And so for planning purposes, it would be nice if those prices were more or less smooth. They didn't jump around too much, but basically, the fluctuations in the in the API tells you this risk for you know, budgeting for everyday stuff. This is stuff you have to budget for, and if these prices, so knowing how these prices are going to behave, how they have behaved in the past, tells you you know how hard or easy it is to budget for this sort of thing. This is also the difference between the everyday price, prices and then the durable goods. Is also in in how you can plan for it. I, mean, I don't know, maybe. Prices of things like cars or, or computers change a lot, but it's not like you absolutely have to buy it today. You can plan for these people usually do. They plan for these purchases, and they could be moved in time. You can buy your car three months later or three months earlier, or you can buy your computer purchase and move it in time. Moving in time, purchase of food is a little bit hard. So do you, you do you exclude consumer technology products? Uh, Yes. If, if, if by that you mean computers and cellular phones. Phones. People buy those like every year. Yes. So the, like, like I said, the rule here is something that you buy at least once a month goes into index. If it's less often than that, it doesn't. Now, consumer technology services, if you will, your cell phone bill is in here because that happens every month. Your index is important because this is what has back the like psychologically affect the economy, that's why it's important? I mean... Well, that's one reason. That's what people, how they psychologically feel what prices are, are happening. But it also affects their everyday budget. Meaning, let's say... Like, like macroeconomic, like macroeconomic, I mean, if you have to think about your index, why is it important? Because, like, psychologically people are being affected by these everyday that's feeling that's feeling. one reason when people see their everyday expenditures go expensive. up they feel they, like they will buy less and, and or they will buy less of their other stuff or, or yes that's one reason another reason is that it really does affect people's ability to plan their purchases you know for like say a few months ahead because other things that we mostly exclude from here are fixed over time, like rent or mortgage, you know, once you have it, this is what it is. You can plan for this. Uh, and big expenditures like durable goods, which also you can plan for. This, the variation in these everyday prices hits people all of a sudden. So for people, say, who are on more or less fixed incomes, like retirees, this is going to affect their ability to spend on other stuff really significantly. And also, you know, just uh, for everybody else, that this this is like the you know for the consumer's ability to plan and spend and consumer confidence maybe in a way uh, because lately you can it's not just us I've seen this in many publications people say oh inflation is higher than they say um, inflation in the stuff you buy a lot is higher than they say but the inflation overall in the economy is lower but like there was one article that I read that uh, this was some sort of town hall meeting or something was 
president and somebody in the audience say, well, the, you know, inflation is high, and then, well, because official numbers, you know, you can't eat an, eat an iPad. <laughs> and Poland was like, listen, I need to buy food. The fact that technology products are getting better and cheaper doesn't help me buy food. <laughs> There's that, let me mention something real quick. That, that when you, whenever there's a high risk like that, people take, they take steps to protect themselves. And so you'll see larger precautionary balances being held because they don't know what they're going to wind up having to, to, to pay this month. So they spend less. Like. So they spend less, they hold back, they, they, they carry larger balances. Because you don't know when you go to the grocery store, maybe, you know, I, I, I've done it, I've gone there which thinking I'm going to spend. Savings, which is not bad. Which, yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, but for me, it's also going to affect. But I look at the U.S. economy because they are getting the function of the spending. Yeah, so they kind of go wrong. Yeah, there's a trade-off between if you hold yeah, of course, but, but that's only possible also. if you know the difference, the difference between 3% and 8%. If you don't know the difference between the 3% and 8%, you'll probably end up assuming 3%, and you'll see less as a well, to what you would do with it. Another way to think of this um, from a financial perspective is that you've got these outflows. You've got these cash outflows that you have to, you, you will spend every month to live. And then you've got your cash inflows, which is usually your salary and things like that. And if these are going up at a rate faster than your salary is going up, you will have less disposable income. So that's, that's kind of, your, your salary is probably not going up at an 8% rate, but these guys are. So it squeezes your ability to spend on discretionary items. But don't, don't you agree? We, we didn't go into this with an agenda to try to achieve some change or something. We were just trying to understand these mechanisms in the economy, and it tells us a lot about how people behave. It also tells us something about the, the consumer confidence, the, the sense of how they're experiencing the economy, and therefore how they're going to make expenditures and so on. So it was a, a broader uh, issue for us. And when we negotiate our salaries, we should use the EPI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. uh, so you mentioned that so after this conversation, like, I assume that it like, gets more volatile. Uh, CPI. Yeah. And um, is there um, like what are the indices in U.S. Um, like uh, EPI explains more than CPI? What, uh, is there any uh, instances that like, ha has a higher correlation uh, than uh, CPI? Or is it? I'm fully sure what the question is. So yeah. okay, uh, how about? Hold on a second here. I'll I'll show you the chart where the divergence, and then maybe maybe I'll be able to answer the question better. I wanna do something. Yeah. Um. In our macro course, we've been taught that the the inflation expectations equals the past inflation. So so people when they form expectations, which one are they forming? They forming for the short term everyday prices and adjusting for that or. All right, uh, oh, that's that I, I can answer. First of all, we, as economists, don't know. Generally, don't know how people form their expectations. Right. Uh, theoretically, there are two possible extremes, if you will. One of them is called adaptive expectations, meaning I think tomorrow is going to be like the average of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, there are the ones called rational expectations, which basically means I'm going to take into account all the information and pretty much know my expectation for tomorrow is going to be whatever tomorrow really is. That doesn't happen in life very often. Well, neither one of these probably happens. Uh, uh, so some in between thing happens. People know what, more or less know what prices have been doing in the past, and they can still modify the expectation for the future. Because if I know what's been happening in the past, and Mr. Bernanke decided to triple the money supply, I'll, you know, I'll expect something other than what happened in the past. Now. How people, in fact, form expectations, not only we as economists don't know, usually humans don't know. If you were to pull a person off the street and ask them, what do you think inflation is going to be, maybe they'll give you a number. And if you ask them, how did you arrive at that, they'd be like, I don't know, that's what I think. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but this partly might explain, that this probably fits into how, you, how most people form expectations. Somehow they, they observe what's going on and they somehow make a guess. Now, what this thing, the, the prices we put in the EPI are the prices people observe more often. So if you ask a person, you know, what happened to the price of gas over the last three weeks, they will be able to tell you. If you ask them what happened to the price of television over the last three weeks, they'll be like, I have no clue, I didn't buy one. <laughs> um, so somebody who did buy them in the last three weeks might have an answer. But, and actually, this is 
and e economists have done this, behavioral economists have done this research. Price of gasoline is kind of really emotional topic in the United States, <laughs> more so than other countries. And people usually get upset about price of gas much more than they do about other prices, even when other prices go up more than that. And even we don't spend all that much on gasoline. It's, it's 5 7% or something like that of the expenditures. But there is just because you do it all the time, and, and psychologically, because the way you do it is you stand there and you see money around on the table. <laughs> that makes people really pay attention. It just so happens that's the mechanism that makes people really remember this. And so people are always upset about price of gas going up. How much that feeds into their expectations of overall inflation, I don't know, but it probably feeds some. Let me add one thing. I, I she, she said it all perfectly. I'm not, not, not uh, arguing that all, but I did, I did hear people mention Fred Mishkin uh, last night, and, and Fred, Fred's great economist in the world. And, uh, he did an interesting study uh, in the early 80s where they looked at a panel of 20,000 families and how they moved through time and, and, and looked at their how they formed their expectations about inflation. And they were looking at these two options that, that Lynn had just mentioned. And the first one, the adaptive expectations, creates uh, more errors. They make more mistakes about their expectations, which cost them and hurts them, right? And so it's interesting to know which, which way do people form. And now, as Lena said, they don't know how they form it, but we can look at their behavior and back out what, which is the more consistent way they're doing it. And it turned out that something like 75% of people uh, uh, use something more like adaptive expectations and a smaller number do, do uh, rational expectations. And as you can imagine, if you look at the families and the, and the, 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 uh, the income levels and the, the educational levels, it's going to be the people who, who are, are working the, the 60 hour week and, and doing physical labor and don't have the PhD in economics that are probably not trying to figure out to what degree the, the level of bank reserves and Fed policy <laughs> is affected. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're just going by what they experience. So the point of this is, is that there's a distributional effect to this. If, if, if people are making large expectational errors about, about inflation, the people that are going to get really hurt are the people who can least afford to get hurt. So, so this is really important for us to uncover. Okay, so I was talking about which one we include and exclude. We put on the website sort of a short description of methodology. And there is a, we have a table of things that uh, goes into the EPI. It's so like I said, food and beverage is uh, clearly everyday expenditure, and it's the biggest chunk of the CPI. The, uh, the second biggest chunk is what we call motor fuel transportation, which is basically gasoline, car insurance, and this is the public transport as a city bus as opposed to airline. Uh, then there is household utilities and fuel and housekeeping supply and things like cleaning products. Uh, Several categories from recreation, most of actually almost all of these are services, cable and satellite service. Uh, fees for lessons and instructions, uh, admissions to movie theaters, club use, these are this is the newspaper All together they're not that big piece. And then there is postage service, telephone service, internet service, but not the telephone or the computer itself. Uh, and then a the few more prescription drugs, child care, tobacco. Point being, if you buy it, you buy it every month. If you don't buy it, you don't buy it at all. <laughs> uh, and uh, personal care products is like two space and, and services like haircuts. Uh, so up here are the weights for inside of the API for 2011. All of the EPI, if you put all these things together compared to all the goods that are in, in the CPI, this is about 39% of expenditures go onto, onto the, our categories. And, the, and that, that changes, like because weights are just at every year, that changes a little bit from year to year. But over time, we have data since 1987, it was anywhere between 37 and 39.5%, so it's more or less constant. So about slightly less than 40% is what you spend on this everyday stuff. You said that you use the CPI weights, so you yes. scale those up based on well, your baseline? Well, yes, obviously, uh, we, we, we selected these things from the, from the CPI, and then ended up being 39%, then we made it 100. Okay. I mean, that's what you need so to make this stuff, okay. clearly. So, I mean, it's, in order to 
well, I mean, I can put this into 39 and all these numbers to be different, but just to show which, to know which one we see is drive my, my plane like this. That's what I think. Um, so. so let me show you what the index actually did recently. In 2011, this is how these different categories, I mean, these are the big groups, right? Food, water, fuel, household, utilities, all that. Um, this is what happened to prices of these things. Overall, EPI increased 8% last year. The biggest increase there was in water fuel transportation, mostly gasoline. It showed up 21%. Uh, there was a big, bigger increase as well as prescription drugs, food, tobacco. The thing that mostly drives, uh, now, weights of these different categories are different. So the, the thing that mostly drives the, drove the increase in the EPI last year was gas, yes, because it's so big and it's about 20% of the index, and food, because that's a big chunk of the index. Tobacco, even though it increased a lot, it's a very small part of the index, it doesn't do a whole lot. Prescription drugs is not that small, it's, it's not a large part of the index, but it contributes a bit. Um, this is what happened historically. These are these different categories of the EPI, starting from the beginning, where I scale them all to 100 and see what happens over time. So the EPI itself is this brown, golden, green line, whatever you like to call it. Um, so the, of the different categories, the, the big increase on top, that's tobacco. And it's mostly driven, these big spikes up, is mostly by taxes. Because the way this looks at the price, the, the consumer pays, and there's a good chunk of that is taxes. That does not drive the EPI all that much because historically, if you look at fraction of uh, expenditures that people spend on tobacco, it's shrinking over time. Now, more people smoke here than they do over there. It just, that's, the, so even though this is a huge increase, it like increased more than six times over this period, the, the price. It doesn't do, as much of an increase in the overall index because the, the share of it in the index falls. Uh, this line is recreation, this line is prescription drugs. Uh, so some point here being some parts of the index increase faster than the index itself, some parts increase slower. Food is actually slower on the bottom. But if if you wanna if you look at these jumps up and down in the index, they are mostly driven by this guy jumps up and down lot. That's the motor fuel and transportation oh. part. So, <coughs> yeah, there it is. So, so this big jump up and then down, and, and this, in the, uh, this jump in the index is mostly driven by motor fuel transportation. And here is the food part, which is right here, which is also quite well. This is the food thing. Uh, so the two most volatile components in here are for sure fuel and food. Actually, this is another complaint, so to speak, we sometimes hear from people. Because for policy purposes, when people use uh, price indices, CPI is consumer price index of everything. There's this thing called core CPI, which is CPI excluding food and energy. And I would very often hear the complaint from like, well, that's a useless thing because, you know, I'm sorry, food and energy is exactly the thing you need to buy all the time. Well, CPI excluding food and energy is not used to describe how consumers live. That's clearly not, that purpose is completely different. It specifically excludes the volatile components so that we can see the underlying trend in prices and that's useful for policy purposes, figuring out where the prices are going. But to figure out your everyday experience, you really need to put those things back in. And in our index, they have a heavier weight than they would in the overall CPI because we don't put much stuff. So that's where a lot of this volatility comes from these volatile components being part of it. So overall, once we compare it to CPI, here's what happens. This is the inflation. Oh, this is the level. Start from 100, black one is the CPI, the golden one is the EPI. So from 1987 to today, CPI a little bit more than doubled. EPI went up more than that, like two and a half times. 
But the interesting thing is from here to about here, it didn't really matter which index you use to try to figure out what's going on. They were increasing at about the same rate. Like say, hypothetically, if you had wage indexation, or indexation for benefits, social security or something like this. If you were indexing them by CPI over here or by EPI over here, they would have exactly the same effect, very close. Because the trend in prices was more or less the same. And then somebody flipped a switch right around this time, and the trend became different. The everyday prices trend increased <coughs> the slope as high, and it became more volatile than the, the, the CPI. But wouldn't that be because the international price of oil started to fluctuate? That, that would be one reason, yes. So international price of oil somehow changed its behavior around here. My guess being there are, there are several reasons, one of which a lot of the developing countries are developing and <laughs> drinking more oil, and that drive the price up. Drove the price up here much more than it was here. You know, they, they, they China and Brazil and India got to a point where they consumed really industrialized quantities of oil. Another thing that probably happened in the world price of oil is various financial innovations made it possible for people to play oil price much easier than they used to be. I mean, I could go on my computer, buy an oil ETF with a touch of a button. It's kind of harder to do down here. So maybe more specul I mean, I don't know this for sure, but it's possible that more speculation goes into price of oil now than it used to do. And so it became a volatile because of that. That would be one reason for sure why, why this happens. But practically what this means is in, if you say thinking about indexing some sort of government benefit program to some cost of living for people, up here it didn't matter which one you chose, which index you chose, because the inflation was pretty close for most of them. But today, now that these changes happen, it actually does matter. If you're going to index uh, payments according to this index, this is what people feel. Their expenditures do this. And you're going to index according to this, you pass on the risk of the volatility to, to the recipients of, of, this, of these payments. You're not, you're not really compensating them for the increase or the volatility. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I assume people who are on fixed incomes or have lower incomes probably spend, you know, higher than forty percent of their income probably. on the constituents of the yes. of that index. So, and vice versa, you would, those be those who have higher more incomes important. probably yes. spend much less. So, um, I mean, so I wonder if that explains psychology between lower income people. Maybe they're seeing their prices rise much more quickly than higher income people just because they're spending a much higher percentage. That's an excellent point. I have to those. second that. <laughs> because, yes, it's uh, the, uh, if you think about it, the things I excluded from excluded from our index and about the goods are these durable goods and, uh, and you know, cars and things like that. And the lower income people do those much less often. <laughs> than the high income people. So the things that are included, like food, gas, utilities, childcare, you know, milk and all that, is much bigger fraction probably so for low income people. So that becomes even more, so this illustrates that they're kind of, I mean, the volatility is the risk, you know, the uncertainty. Yeah, so that, that's been a much bigger problem for people who spend most of their income on the other yeah, right? question is the units on the, is that? Sure, it's an index. It's so with that? What is going on? So, so between January 1987 and January 1991, prices jumped by 20%. Yes. Okay. And this is what inflation looks like. Now, this is the 12, 12 months change, percentage change from 12 months ago in each of these indices. Same, same period of time. So basically, this is what I was saying. Up to about here, inflation is rate is pretty similar. Now, EPI is more volatile inflation, you know, it kind of goes around, the, the yellow line goes around the, the black line because the more volatile components are, have higher weight than the EPI. But trend is more or less the same in the inflation. You know, or like over here, this period from 1990 to like 96, it's, it's all around 3 years percent. Uh, but then over here, we start having these much bigger swings 
an API around around the CPI trend. Well, what's this graph different from the previous one? Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. you know, say again. What's this graph different from the previous one? It's taking difference or? This, or this is a percentage true. change. Uh, okay, difference. So this is the, this is the percent that tells you, like you can read off inflation from here. Uh, like, you know, in, in, the, in the end, for 12 months going to January of 2012, CPI increased, that's your 3.1. And the EPI for those 12 months, it increased from one to five. But for any, to figure out inflation for the year, you have to average the 12 months. That's what the eight comes from. You, can't, you don't have data before 1988? Uh, I cannot. I cannot get disaggregated data for the C I have CPI going back sure. further, but I wasn't able to get the, the pieces of the CPI separately going back that far. It probably exists somewhere, I mean, if, we mean in the sense that if I really try to approach a BLS and maybe they'll give it to me. But yeah, I'm curious say, whether they track back, you know, through the, well, the late 70s and, the, well, the oil, oil yeah, stuff well, in the early I, 70s. And, because CPI exists that far, maybe that data exists someplace. Meaning, I don't know if there was, they kept the disaggregated components or they just kept the results. I haven't really tried to dig this out, primarily because I didn't have time to. Uh, I can try to dig this out, but it's quite possible that either they don't keep the disaggregated pieces or they're in some big box of paper somewhere. Right. Part of the problem <laughs> is in the mid 80s, they put them on Excel. And before that, they didn't have an Excel. Like so said, is this why you guys have the summer fellows? Papers. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm wondering about the long. I mean, whatever conclusions you're going to come to, I'm just wondering about. No, no, it's totally years, interesting yeah. to, to go back a couple more decades. That's yeah, no question. no question there. Right now, it was just a time constraint. Right. right. If we go back to the previous slide, if that EPI uh, stays above CPI. Uh, over time, is it reasonable to expect that CPI would begin to be pulled up by those components because some of the major components will eventually affect the cost of other Well, uh, in a way, yes. If the EPI stands above the CPI, that, that means part of the CPI is growing faster. Now, the fact that the CPI is, uh, is, uh, is below means that there's something else that's pulling the CPI prices down. And that's exactly the point. Why do we, what do we think what are these things that I, I try to figure out so what is it would happen? Now one you just picked out, price of oil. We all started doing weird stuff in the last ten years. Yeah, but just, yeah, it's coming in the seventies had it could have had the same. And uh, the price of food now is going up as well. well. But so. then yes, the other thing is price of food. It's so one thing that, that you have is heavily weighted components in the API, like energy and food. Their prices have been increasing faster in the recent decade or so. For part of that being, I think, really developing of the developing countries. And they consume more, more uh, oil, and also as they get richer, they consume more food, which is good for them, but that makes the food prices go up. Another thing that, I, that is happening, I think, is that this differential effect on technological advances on goods and services that we buy. And this is where what Steve mentioned, quality adjustment. If you take a look, I didn't put a graph here, but if you want, go to BLS website and get the price series for something like televisions, the one of the components. It looks like this, booms. <laughs> it falls by, we're talking 80, 90%. Now, television right now, going to store costs, what is it, $1,500, $500, depending on the television. It's more dollars than it cost 10 years ago. But the reason it's cheaper in the CPI is quality adjustment. Because television right now is so much better than it was 10 years ago. So for a lot of goods where that, that change over time substantially, mostly due to technological advances, they do quality adjustment. That includes TVs, phones, cars, uh, many other things. Because the idea behind that is what CPI is intended to measure is not how much it costs you to buy stuff. CPI intends to measure how much your dollar can buy. So $500 10 years ago could buy you a certain kind of TV. $500 today could buy you a much better TV, which means per unit of TV, TV is cheaper. <laughs> per quality unit. 
So a lot of the durable goods, or maybe most of them, have quality adjustments that makes them either cheaper over time, or at least their prices don't go up as much as the sticker price seems to indicate. The technology goods are especially heavy in these quality adjustments. Yeah, I understand that the iPhone costs more than four ninety nine if you buy if you just buy the iPhone. Uh, but you can compare that to the phone you bought ten years ago, which did not cost four ninety nine at all. <laughs> but it was this is no comparison of what this is. So technological advances restrain the increase in prices of these goods where technology improves them. But most of those, in fact, basically all of them, are not in part of our index. They're part of the CPI, and that restrains the CPI from rising. But we don't have any of the durable goods, phones, TVs, or computers in the everyday pricing index. So the benefits of technology, which are real, don't do anything to your grocery bill. And so they restrain the CPI growth, but our prices still keep going up because we, technology doesn't, doesn't quite cut back on cost of a lot of the things that we buy every day. Tomatoes are still tomatoes, it's the way they were before. Uh, another thing that, uh, another factor there, the globalization makes food and energy more expensive maybe, but it also makes certain things cheaper for us, the things we, the imported goods, including appliances and, and uh, apparel and things like that, and that restrains the growth of the CPI. Again, most of those are not part of the, our index. So the, the power of globalization technology to restrain prices doesn't help in an everyday prices. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that the quality adjustments, I think that was a, uh, a change that took place maybe in the, in the 90s, how they're calculating CPI. So uh -huh. I'm just wondering what, what your opinion is on that. I mean, personally, I mean, I think if people are measuring their incomes versus CPI, mm -hmm. um, it can be problematic because if you're actually paying higher prices, you won't have as much disposable income left, even if you're getting okay. the same quality you were getting before. I mean, you can't buy a phone from 10 years ago. You have to buy, right. yeah, yeah, buy I, the phone. I, yeah, I, I saw your point. One. Well, first of all, you're right, but the quality adjustment was introduced uh, at some point. Actually, that's probably why the data breaks in 1987. This is where a lot of, they, they majorly changed methodology in 1987. Then there was another change around 1991, including the own equivalent rent and mortgage, how that's calculated. Uh, so, but yeah, quality adjustment was introduced some time in the, and actually, over time, they, it's, it's not like we are going to introduce it for everything. First, it was introduced for some things, and then they sort of looked to see whether it needs to be introduced for other products as well, because, you know, there was no... They didn't think they need to be quality adjustment for phones until they went to the cell phones. Because <laughs> for several decades, a phone was this, you know, thing you do this with. It was, there was not much quality adjustment there. Uh, now. The general question about this, does quality adjustment make sense in a way? Once again, it depends on what it is you're trying to measure. One, one more time, CPI is trying to measure how much more your dollar can buy. That's not exactly cost of living index. That's a, that's a purchase and power index. Now, if you want to measure how much does it cost me to buy normal things people buy, that's not, CPI doesn't measure this. Meaning like if you say, if you make a list, you know, uh, rent, car, you know, phone, something like, you know, the stuff you normally buy all the time. So what happens is, over time, because of proven technology, the stuff you normally buy every time will be better. The poorer people now will live better than poorer people lived in 1955. So the standard of living is better. Uh, but there also cost them more to buy this sort of stuff. So CPI openly says in the definition, they're trying to measure what it costs to, uh, for consumers to maintain the exactly same standard of living. Now, maintaining the standard of living may not be possible. Like there's, there's one example, somebody sent me the same one, might have been Steve. There's some person compu uh, uh, computed what a computer would cost from 1968, a computer in 1968, a computer right now. We know how quality estimate for computers is now. They actually do a regression on various component, various attributes of a computer: memory, CPU speed, you know, hard drive, all that kind of stuff. So they put it together, figure out how important each of these components are, kind of figure out how you average this to have a quality score. 
And so he looked, this person looked at the first computer or something in 1968 or 1972, something like this, which had you know, like 8K of memory <laughs> and this sort of stuff, to a typical computer right now. And of course, that thing in 1968 cost like $1,000, I mean, some ridiculous amount. I mean, $1,000 in 1968 was all oh, 5000 something huge like this. Uh, and, and so, and then, then this computer is so much more, and I, I think it was like both $1,000, $1,000 here. And then he figured out from, so in today's prices, that computer would cost a penny. And then he recomputed all this quality stuff. That old computer would cost one cent in today's money. Because the problem is, if I wanted to buy that computer today, I can't. There is not a one cent computer somewhere on the market right now. So maybe my computer is a thousand dollars per cent, what is that? Well, you know, hundred thousand times better. But I don't have an option of spending the less money to buy the old computer. It's not here. So if you want to measure how much it costs you to buy normal stuff today versus normal stuff yesterday versus normal stuff last year, CPI does not do that. So because CPI measures how much it costs you to buy the same computer from 1968 up to right now. You don't have that option, but that's not the objection. <laughs> that's not the objective. It's kind of like they're trying to measure how much more your money buys now. So if the flip side would be trying to create the real cost of living index. What does it cost to for people to buy, you know, the normal set of things right now, acknowledging that the standard of living is probably improves over time. That would require killing the quality adjustment, I would think. Uh, I'm not aware of an index that's been created that way, but we can try. <laughs> it's quite complicated because trying to figure out the quality adjustments go into many places here in very insidious ways. <laughs> I mean, the computer is an obvious one, but they do this for houses, they do this for cars. And most of the things we have in the API don't have quality adjustment. There's no quality adjustment for apples and, and milk and stuff like that. So food and gasoline doesn't have those. Most of the services don't have quality adjustments. Not because the quality didn't change, but I think primarily because it's impossible to do quality adjustments. But some things maybe do. Um, I wasn't able to figure out all the methodology, but things like prescription drugs might have some quality adjustments in them. Things like cable TV service, believe it or not, actually has a very crude quality adjustment just by the number of channels. Like if, 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 if 10 years ago you signed up for $50 and it was 50 channels and now it's 80 channels, you assume to have 60% more stuff. Even though maybe those three channels you got, you never would turn on. Uh, so some of the things in our index do have potential quality adjustments, but it's a, much, it's a very small fraction somewhere. 10, 15 percent of, of the stuff that we have could potentially have quality adjustments, but they're nowhere near as big as they would be for technology-headed products. And of course, adjustment for cable television is there probably, but it's it's not like the price did not fall by 90 percent like it did for TVs and computers. All right, um, that's pretty much all I had to say. Just the, bigger, the last three months recently what's been happening. In 2012, we still have EPI rising faster than CPI. This is percent per month for these two. And that's there for the last 24 months, just the picture. That the blue guy is the EPI increase every month, month to month inflation. And the red one is, is the CPI. So this is the last three months. Now, there, there are times when the EPI falls. There are times when CPI falls. Uh, now, one point I want to make that I probably didn't emphasize before, if you go back and look at CPI numbers, you might find that my numbers are different than what they talk about in newspapers, because we use not seasonally adjusted numbers. Usually what people report is seasonally adjusted EPI. Now, for annual numbers, it doesn't matter, they're the same. But for months to months, it does matter. The reason for that being, this is from Bill, I, I, I like this so much, I copied it. This is from BLS manual. If you want to analyze annual price trends in the economy, you have to use seasonal adjusted numbers because that eliminates seasonal fluctuations, holidays, you know, Independence Day sale, and all those things. However, if you want to, you, if your primary interest is the prices you actually pay, 
then you need to use the nodes as an ill-adjusted numbers. And since we're trying to figure out what happens to prices people actually pay out of pocket for <coughs> their everyday items, we use the unadjusted numbers. Which is why, because in the season, oh, the wrong location. If you go look at seasonal adjusted numbers, there will not be a fall on this, a fall on this guy over here. There will be a tiny increase. Because this seasonal pattern is partly driven by what gas prices do in the fall. They're in the CPI as well. So the numbers that we have, these ones, for the CPI are somewhat different. Like seasonal adjusted one, I think, is 0.2 over here as opposed to 0.4. That kind of stuff. But we want to actually look at the price fluctuations as they actually happen. It's not about the trend, it's about out of pocket expenditure here. So we look, we don't adjust it. Do you, do you conclude from this that monetary policy makers are looking at misleading, um, you know, misleading inflation figures? Not, not really. Uh, once again, it depends on the question they're trying to answer. Now, if they're trying to answer the effect of policy, monetary policymakers is usually worried about the trend. You know, is, 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 is the suspension of money driving all the prices upwards? And for the trend, CPI is, is what it was designed to be. Do, do, are we driving all price, consumer prices upward by our policy? So for policy purposes, CPI or even the core CPI, once you remove food and energy, is probably a reasonable measure. Now, if you want to, what I can do from this is if you want to try to figure out people's experiences and things like escalating wages or, or, or benefits or what happens to people on fixed incomes or what happens to low income people or high income people, then CPI is not one of those things. The CPI is not appropriate because it averages all the interesting stuff out of it, basically. It averages everything and smoothes it out. And so what you get is a trend. If what you're not interested in is not a trend, but what happens this month versus next, what happens to certain groups of people, what happens to certain types of expenditures, then... But EPI might tell more about, might tell policy makers more about um, inflation expectations, right, among, among the general could population. Could be. It could be useful exactly. input into if, if, into if they wanted to have a model for how people form expectations. This probably informs it a little bit. Yes, I would say. Didn't occur to me. You mentioned that the, the Fed is aware that there's some problems with the CPI. And, uh, the core CPI was an attempt to, to strip out volatile components to get a better, better view. And that didn't even work so well. So, so now they're focusing a lot of their, their policy on the personal consumption expenditures later, which is the broadest possible uh, uh, index of consumer prices and, and, and dynamic rates and so on. So I mean, they're, they're struggling. And it's sort of interesting because this, this will sort of lead a little bit into my presentation in a while. But, but the Fed has been trying different inflation uh, indexes and it's been trying different uh, monetary aggregates, trying to find the right connection to be able to connect the money to the, to the prices. And it's, it's been frustrating. So in terms of the social security payments then, mm -hmm. um, social security payments have only been rising based on CPI. Well, technically speaking, they've been rising based on the CPI W, which is very similar to the black line, not exactly the same. Right. Yeah. Yes. The cost of living is basically- Has there ever based been discussion? I mean, in terms of like from that, well, basically when it breaks is like, you know, 2003 about I mean, has there been any kind of high-level policy discussions on whether they should be increasing that at a higher rate? Uh, as far as Congress and the like, no. Now, somebody like, there are groups that lobby for uh, retired people like AARP who right. would argue, like, for, the, for two years, uh, right around the CPI was fallen. For two years, 2009 uh, and 2010, or 10 and 11, I forget. There was no cost of living adjustment because the CPI actually was falling, uh, which does not stop ARP from saying this still should be. And their argument is uh, not so not our, they, they didn't have the EPI, but their argument is still that the CPI doesn't properly uh, capture the expenditures of retirees because it's based, I mean, for whatever reason, they chose the CPI double. Consumer price index, urban wage earners with variable workers, meaning, the goods that are included in that index are what urban wage earners spend their money on. 
And that's probably different than when retirees spend their money on. Retirees don't do college tuition so much, but they do a lot more of the medical care than would be the younger people. So there is this argument that is made periodically around the cost of living adjustment time that the index is not that good to capture retirees' expenditures because they have higher things on on medical care that is rising faster and much lower expenditures on iPhones, which are getting cheaper according to the CPI. And so there's some argument that it doesn't adequately capture their expenses, but there hasn't been any action or even proposal for action, I don't think, to actually change the formula. I mean, it's written into Social Security Act, into law. You would need to, uh, I don't know, maybe politicians don't want to open the can of forms about let's change something about Social Security because once you start that, there's many more things you would want to change about it. Right. So there were, in, in the media you hear this from places like ARP, you would hear this, that, that it's not an adequate measure. It measures the wrong thing. Nobody's done it. The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics did uh, develop an alternative index, uh, an experimental index they call it, yeah. CPI-E, CPI for the elderly try to explore whether or not uh, older people have a different price index. Of course, they, they buy different stuff. They buy more drugs, they buy less school, you know, lots of things like that. And if there was a difference, uh, they, they, they looked at it, we did a study on it ourselves, and, uh, but it just disappeared. Yes. <laughs> no, they started doing that CPIE experimental index sometime in the 80s, 1982 or something. I think this was the closest we got into a high level discussion where Congress has actually asked the BLS to, the BLS is the government agency, you know, to, to develop an index to see if it's different. And what they did, they still didn't do a separate survey for, for elderly. They just, they, they did a survey of what they spend their money on and they re-weighted the part, pieces of the CPI, weighted according to expenditures of people 65 plus. Uh, and so I guess at one point in the past there was the idea maybe we should look into it, but not a lot of action has been done. On this. You can still get it from ELS. They, they don't publish it, but if you call them up, they'll give it to you. Uh, but it's just kind of there to take a look. You probably need a break here. Uh, yeah. Thank you.